Thanks so much, Nathan, and thank you for um, allowing me to give my sort of introduce my dissertation here. I would say I think that's kind of the right word for it. Um, so yeah, the the paper that I'm presenting today is part of my dissertation project. Um, and that is, as Nathan mentioned, centered around the question of positioning um, the lived and transcendental subject in and with the world. Um, or really, the question, where does the body um, end and the world begin, um, or vice versa? Um, or being body, being in, it, in its body, and being outside its body. But also the question um, about multiplicitous selves. Um, who are these selves that live in oneself or surround ourselves or oneself. And in some ways, um, thinking about our discussion that we just had for the last talk, where we talked about sort of the, the scientific revolution and how the effects are on, on poetry and the lyric, I'm trying actually to work the opposite direction. I'm coming from the sciences. I'm trying to use poetics and the lyric to um, address questions within the sciences and see if you know, and, and through philosophy, if there is kind of um, sort of an interdisciplinary way um, to work the opposite way for once. Um, in particular, um, I want to consider the subject through the lens of the neurophysiological concept of allostasis, a concept of anticipatory regulation of the internal milieu in the context of the changing exigencies within the environment. The mentally and bodily processing of stimuli encountered in the world enables a physiological as well as um, psychological preparedness for the subject to maintain or regain homeostasis. An equilibrium both uh, the subject's body and the, of both the subject's body and the mind in the lived world. It is for all intents and purposes a feed-forward loop that prepares us for what is to come via past experiences both imagined and real. It is an adjustment through anticipation. Um, so the approach that I want to take for my dissertation work is really to be interdisciplinary and draw, as Nathan mentioned, on poetics, literary theory, neurophysiology, and philosophy. And um, well, the dissertation is sort of a, um, a bigger work drawing on different poets, um, including Hölderlin, uh, Prynn, Loy, and track also today what I'm presenting is really a part of thinking how effective communication as conceived through Kant's aesthetic judgment and silence um, affect the notion of allostasis as a subject towards the world looking at Georg Trakl's work. And I just want to say that this is still very much work in progress and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. I also want to note um, that while I've been working with Alexander Stillmark's bilingual edition of Georg Trakl's poetry, uh, the translation that I'm having up on the slides are actually all my own. Um, I want to begin with the third stanza of Georg Trakl's Abendland, um, of the poem uh, version, the poem's version as it was published in the collection Sebastian im Traum in 1915, but written before World War I. Um, it is within the, collection, uh, within the collection of Sebastian and Traum. The poem is part of the section entitled Gesang des Abgeschiebenen, or Song of the Recluse. Um, and it's this particular section that I will mostly focus on today. Um, I will probably read it out in, in German, but you have both up there, both translation there. So I'm just focusing on the third stanza. Ihr großen Städte, steinern aufgebaut in der Ebene, so sprachlos folgt der Heimatlose mit dunkler Stirne, dem Wind, kahle ba kahlen Bäumen am Hügel. Ihr weithin dämmernden Ströme, gewaltig ängstete, schaurig Abendröte im Sturmgewölk. Ihr sterbenden Völker, bleiche Woge zerschellend am Strande der Nacht, fallende Sterne. The scene evokes an image of isolation, desolation, and inevitability. A homeless wanderer crosses over a hill while overhead in, in clouds eerily colored by the setting sun, a storm threatens. As he looks towards the city built of stone on the plain below, several cries are issued. Towards the city and those who build it, the far dawning streams of humanity, the dying peoples, foreshadowing um, of their decay. 
The Free Speech Act also sectioned the stanza into three spheres, humanity, the lone sphere of the wanderer, and that of the natural world. It is only after the last call that the spheres are superimposed in some way, the pale surge of humans, the waves breaking on the shore at night, but unlike the water, which does so infinitively, they will shatter, the individual light or souls extinguish. There are other spheres of demarcation within, the, within that stanza, this ostensibly walled city that separates man from nature, and the homeless wanderer who is now shut out from his protective circle by force or choice, a solitary figure upon the hill. And there's also the delineation or temporality, an indication of a past when the cities were built, the present moment as we encounter the stormy scene, and an inevitable future, the death of man, which is heralded by the lyrical speaker. The fact the figure of the lone wanderer is not only homeless, but is also speechless, begs the question, who issues these calls that are shared, that shares across the boundaries of distance, sentience, and time? The image evoked in Charcoal's Abendland are similar to those um, in the painting The Monk Upon the Sea by German romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich. A man looking out at the sea and the darkening sky, a possible storm threatening in the distance. He shares with the observer a pregnant moment before the climax of action or emotion, allowing them to imagine what is yet to come. At the time of the painting's first exhibition in 1810, the editor of the Berliner Abendblätter, Heinrich von Kleist, commented, how wonderful is it to sit completely alone by the sea under an overcast sky, gazing out over the endless expanse of water it is essential that one has come here, there, come there just for this reason and that one has to return. That one would like to go over the sea, but cannot. That one misses any sign of life and yet one senses the voices of life in the rush of the water, in the blowing of the wind, in the drifting of the clouds, in the lonely cry of the birds. No situation in the world could be more sad and eerie than this, a lonely center in a lonely circle. While Kleist sees the man in a painting searching for a connection with and in nature, he also describes him as a lonely center, a small fragment sad and eerie against the sublimity of the vast cosmos, and not unlike Trakov's homeless wanderer on the hill. For Novalis and the Jena Romantics, Friedrich's painting held a greater significance, namely the alienation of self from self, an untethering from the lived world and the rising of mecha mechanism of interpretation and interpretation of mechanism of the historical moment that lacked existential meaning to understand man in nature and in the world. It is only through a lack of acquaintance with ourselves, um, becoming no longer accustomed to ourselves, that a kind of incomprehensibility arises that is itself incomprehensible. La Cula Barf and Nancy define this romantic subject as a subject that can no longer conceive itself and has not yet truly undertaken its reflections as subject. For Novalis, the remedy to comprehend ourselves is through interpreting the world. No, that's not the right one, sorry. Um, we shall understand the world when we understand ourselves because we and it are integral halves. If we translate the romantic concept of interpreting or understanding the world into neurophysiological terms, um, what we arrive at is interoception, the mo molecular sensing or probing of inner body states in response to a sense experience that informs the individual about the state of the whole body to maintain a future physiological, stable, self-cognizing subject in relation to the world, or more simply put, it is an effective reaction to the environment that is translated into modes of anticipation in the brain. It, is thus, it thus reveals a level of the lived body that is simultaneously disembodied insofar as the eye of I feel pleasure or displeasure refers to a mental subject who experiences the sensation without any explicit reference to a body. Interoceptive feeling is hence disembodied, and as Frédéric de Vignemont suggests, unable to contrast what is inside from what is outside, and thus to set the spatial boundaries of the body. 
Consequently, we interpret inner body experiences through anticipatory modes or models drawn from the outer world as allostasis is shaped by the sense perception in the lived world and as our body is turned inside out in an embodied simulation. As such, interoception is not simply internal sensation or affective experience, but in Joe Leder's terms, um, it throws us forth or projects us into our body and into the lived world, both spatially and temporally. In romantic terms, then, it is to feel the world in ourselves and draw on this perception to attempt a reconciliation between man and nature, or at least a positioning of one uh, to the other. Novalis considered it the social responsibility of the artist to act as a driving force since, as written in Logical Fragments, to become a human, um, is, uh, to become a human being is an art. And the poet, the transcendental physician, who observes, actualizes, and transmutes sense experience into poesis as, quote, poetry dissolves the being of others into its own, with the help of imagination as mediator, a mediator being, uh, who can transgress a boundary within the inner space of feelings and contrived description of the internal external. And that's a quote by Prin. In my wider project, I will therefore consider the lyric as an externalized embodiment of the internal and interoceptive emotions upon encounter with the being outside the body or, in other words, a side of embodied simulation that mediates the intersection between the subject and the lived world towards allostasis. But how is allostasis experience, uh, allostatic experience portrayed? Can it ever not produce a move, movement towards allostasis? Can this kind of articulation ever fail? Um, but it also raises then a question, what enables allostasis in poetic determination? And what would be the consequences, ultimately, of its failure? So let us return for a moment to Trakos Abendland and ask what ultimately brings the spheres of the world and man in the wider sense of humanity into proximity. These are the exclamations of the lyric speaker. While the figure of the van wanderer remains alone, speechless and homeless, unrooted, but also seemingly not influenced by the world around him and as such alienated from it. Using Charcoal's figure of the lone and silent wanderer, I want to examine the role of communicability and more specifically the importance of mitteilen and ansinnen as part of Kantian aesthetic judgment as fundamental aspects of mediation between a transcendental self and a lived body <clears throat> in the lyric. I will suggest that the autoeffective mode of aesthetic judgment and its articulation as universal serves as a vehicle of allostasis to mediate for mitteil between a subject and its lived world. I will suggest that in Trakel, the lack of mitteil through speechlessness and silence of a lyric speaker forestalls that transmutation of sense experience and aesthetic judgment and the transgressing of world subject boundaries not only for closing allostasis, but also severing the internal subject and the external uh, world, so body and world. Um, I have particularly chosen to focus on this set of poems by Trakel um, because of when they were written. So I didn't want to focus on the very last part, uh, last sort of set of poems, the Brenner poems that also included Godrek, mostly because I wanted to avoid the sort of influence of the First World War imagery um, on the sort of examination that I'm doing of what, what I'm using Trakos work as a medium. Um, in On a Journey, uh, one of Trakos' earlier poems, the speaker wanders through the meadow and forest. His steps are cushioned by the fallen leaves and he remarks on the stillness of the autumn day um, and initially unknown under sea. So I read the, the English one. Oh, how mild is the autumn. Our steps sound softly in the old park beneath high trees. Oh, how solemn is the hyacinth face of twilight, the blue spring at our feet. Sounds are muted and the moment evokes a peace of mind in the fading daylight. While the leaves have fallen in the twilight of the year heralding winter, the blue spring beneath their feet suggests a journey um, of transformation. 
Merleau-Ponty considers the perceiving body as a site of enmeshment with the world, while Kant describes sensory experience um, as at such points of enmeshment where it is a reciprocal effect of experience as grounded in the faculty of sensation on both body and mind, culminating in an ec ecstatic experience. The mildness of the autumn and the soft sound of the steps infer a quiet and calm, a quiet beauty. While the experience of the autumn's day within the framework of Kantian's, Kant's third critique might also be considered to be rooted in agreeability or angenehmheit, I argue that what the speaker experiences is rather aesthetic pleasure, an aesthetic judgment of the beautiful. His feelings evoked by the bare audibility, sound of the soft, damp leaves underfoot, carry with it what Kant calls eine Beförderung des Lebens, um, a progression or enrichment of life which is alluded to by the blue spring at your feet, a transformative journey summoned in the imagination. But for Kant, aesthetic judgment of the beautiful must be universal. In judgments by which we describe anything as beautiful, we tolerate no one else uh, being of a different opinion. But while Kant express, expresses acceptance at a universal agreement of an object as beautiful, it is not necessarily a demand. Rather, Kant uses the words zumuten and ansinnen, noting that he who judges an object as beautiful, um, and I read the German, muss glauben Grund zu haben, jedermann ein anhängliches Wohlgefallen zuzumuten. Das Wohlgefallen und einen Gegenstand jedermann anzusinnen. oder um, wirbt und jeden anderen Zustimmung. Weil Zumuten has generally been translated as presuppose or presuppos presupposition expressing a given assumption. Um, similar ansinnen most often has been translated as ascribed or imputed, meaning belonging to or assigned, respectively. It suggests a fixed predetermined mode, the meaning However, the original German words used by Kant in his own time are more suggestive, suggestive than demanding. It's often also a bitten, asking for something. And that is um, according to both Grimm's and Adelung's Wörterbücher. Um, as Elif Friedlander has noted, to pronounce a judgment on what is essentially singular is thus not to speak of what we essentially agree upon, but to speak for an idea of uh, universal agreement. And that's a quote um, from Michael Chahuli's book. For Kant, the idea of a universal agreement of the judgment of taste is, after all, undeterminable. However, the postulation of his universal aesthetic judgment forms the presupposition for the, um, the deduction or unmasking of the subjective freedom of the ability to form an aesthetic judgment or free play in the imagination. In aesthetic judgment, we then do not ask for concurrence or übereinstimmung, but zusammenstimmen, which is not rooted in agreement, but in a joining of voices. What Kant describes also as Mitteilbarkeit or communicability, a universal subjective expression of the aesthetic judgment. Um, and as such, all aesthetic judgments are acts of communication. Hence, the subjective universal judgment of an aesthetic experience something Kant considers as deeply rooted within all human beings, is not alone the ability to make aesthetic judgments, but to be aware of the emotion simulated within oneself and the capacity and wish to communicate this aesthetic judgment um, within oneself and to, uh, towards others, to move beyond the particular towards the universal. It is communication, or uh, from a low ponty language, it becomes the signifier of the ability um, and the uh, ability often to experience and the sharing of this ex aesthetic experience, as well as of human condition and a space in which self-cognition and aesthetic experience can occur. But Mitteilbarkeit goes really beyond language. Instead, voice is transformed into an appeal, a speech act in the same moment as need, the need to communicate is transformed into a desire. It is called in a drama of appeal, eliciting an answer provocation and demand, and recognition, as Martin Dollar suggests. It is this speech act that becomes the vehicle for the universal in aesthetic judgment, and ultimately for allostasis, which I will be arguing. To speak, to hear one's voice, is a profound moment of self-realization and self-assertion, according to Amanda 
a white man. Not simply um, a declaration of fact, but the activation of a host of cultural salient associations between voice and individuality, authorship, agency, authority, and power, associations that are made daily in our common parlance. We find our voice or discover an inner voice. In that sense, Mitterbarkeit embodies all of our notions of voice as presence, agency, rationality, feeling, will, and self. It is then not a demand that everybody ascribes to the same aesthetic judgment, but rather that it's mitteilen or sharing with, creating both intra and intersubjective dimensions of aesthetic judgment, one that reaches within and beyond the boundaries of the self. Thus, when I speak of myself, the voice issuing from me is mine, yet also universal through what Derrida terms out of affection. Out, sorry, out of affection. When I speak, I hear myself, je m'attends. And at the same time that I speak, I'm the affected by the signifier I produce without passing through an external detour, the world, the sphere of what is not my own. While I agree that in the moment of speech act, the speaker becomes auto-affected, I would argue that through unseen and mitteilen, the aesthetic judgment of the beautiful is an effect that is simultaneously internalized and externalized, or again in Leda's words, an effect that throws us forth or projects us into our body and into the lived world from where it reflects back, and hence by nature of its mode of sharing with traverses the world. Thus, in aesthetic judgment, the subject tests its imagination, not through aesthetic experience on the conduct of an object, its former quality, but in the way one's imagination spontaneously puts the object in relation with the feeling of pleasure, pleasure inside the subject. Through this experience, the subject probes, and through it seeks itself, ich versuche mich selbst which places the subject momentarily in the other position, creating a gap in which the subject then oscillates between an I and an other, passive active, the first in relation to apprehending the object uh, and subject, the latter in terms of both imagination and effect, sharing the judgment beyond me in mitteilen, or sharing with. In judgments of beauty, I therefore exceed myself, and it is the movement that the body is turned inside out in an embodied simulation that informs upon allostasis for aesthetic judgment in the lyric speaker. But mittal is not bound to language and can also be articulated through laughter or nonverbal utterances or sounds. For Kant, the mere possibility of an act of voicing an effective judgment and affecting something in me, the effective communication of an interiority, as well as issuing this effect from me into the sphere that exceeds me, in, in that it addresses all and therefore shares all, places my subjective particular judgment into the realm of the universal, turning particular to universal, subject to humanity in and with the world. In springtime of the soul, too, there is a reciprocal voicing, mitteilen of speaker and world. While nature is not self uh, is not self cognizing, the speaker links uh, its rushing and ringing to subjective affective association. Celebratory the water rush, or the moist shades of the meadow, the striding animal, greenery blossoming branches stirs the crystalline brow. Shimmering rock barge quietly rings the sun in roseate mists upon the hill. Great is the stillness of the pine forest, the serious shadows by the river. This passive serendipity, the pleasure of feeling I was not looking for, extends here beyond the subjective into the object. Rather, by making the object active participants in the aesthetic judgment, the speaker's body becomes a place of encounter of effect and becomes a space of intersection between possibility and actuality, ideality and reality, or in Novalis's words, the seed of the soul where the inner and the outer worlds touch. As the subject, in, subject engages in encounters with the world in all these modes of encounters, um, they are followed by a rupture, a traversing of the space in between. And this momentary rupture in thought um, 
and effect denotes, on the other hand, then a ground of total possibility for imagination and interoception, um, as far as allostasis goes. And ultimately, um, as uh, what my larger question is concerned with, um, how this can be um, expressed through the lyric. However, the space of rupture, the moment and space of encounter, can be delimited as much as delimiting. The first through boundary, the body, and the latter through absence, voice. Simultaneously, closure and interruption of the subject in which a probing of self and world would be foreclosed. The affective turn in charcoal towards an affective uh, and voicing object becomes increasingly common, common in the song of the recluse, or Gesang des Abgeschiedenen, um, and signals unbearability of both the cacophony of the world and with it of reality. In the next room, sister plays a sonata by Schubert. Her smile sings most gently in the ruined well, which murmurs bluish in the twilight, oh, how ancient is our lineage. Someone whispers below in the garden, a song for guitar struck up in the strange tavern. It is in a letter to his sister, Hermine von Rautenberg, on October 5th, 1908, that Trago comments on the unbearability, unbearable audibility of life. It was as if I saw life for the first time as clearly as it is, without any personal interpretation, naked, without presuppositions. As if I were hearing all the voices that reality speaks, the cruel ones, embarrassingly audible. And for a moment, I felt some of the pressure that usually weighs on people and the driving force of fate. The fate trackle refers to is, of course, the inevitability of death of man opposite to internal, eternal nature. At evening, they bore the stranger into the death chamber, the soft rustling of red plane trees, the dark flight of jackdaws. On the square, a guard was mounted. The sun has sunk into black linen. This past evening ever more returns. The wild elder bushes there a November day long past. Nature in form of the rustling plane trees and the wild elder bushes will remain behind in this scene and watch the passing of man evermore. Robert Furmage argues that Trockel views nature as the place and substance of, quote, human action and the goal to which our will to knowledge, to self-knowledge, must aspire. However, while it is the place of human action, Trockel's speech speaker desires um, or aspires to none of its wildness and noise. In the flux of life, the speaker is confronted with a world that can, he cannot anticipate nor share with or in. It becomes unspeakable for him, nicht mitteilbar, signaling the increasing silence of the speaker and his retreat from the world. Unspeakable is all this, O oh God, that one fall shattered to one's knees. Nature's wild and life within its midst painful and unpredictable, and to track a speaker it seems inconsumensible and it's in its unboundedness. In On the Way to Language, Heidegger notes that poetry speaks being to disclose beauty and the strangeness of being. Yet for Trakel's speaker, the strangeness of being becomes threatening, unspeakable. While unspeakability in this line still implies the voicing of an aesthetic experience, it is not in sharing of the self as particular or universal, or indeed with the world, but rather with God, a transcendental being that resides outside of both spheres. Robert Fermich writes, the details of experience are simply mentioned. The reader notes the juxtaposition and the sonority of the expression, which in the last line modulates in a cry that, um, though serving to interpret the significance of their recollection, is less an interpretation than a final element in the series. A portrayal of the feeling that accompanies the recollection of feelings engendered by past experiences. Thus, the reader is led by the effective aspect of the poem to an apprehension of his or her own feelings as themselves unspeakable, to a witness of the power of poetry to engender, but nonetheless to fail to comprehend the depths of human experience. With the failure to comprehend human experience, 
beauty transforms into sublimity, imagination and with it, Mittheil fails. In Kantian terms, raw nature falls under the aesthetic judgment of the sublime as it carries within it the intuition, the intuition um, it has carries in the intuition the idea of infinity. As we find our own limitation in the immeasurability of nature, imagination under the guidance of understanding fails and it proves insufficient. Um, however, the judgment of the sublime only exists in the mood of the subject when nature exceeds the measure of our own senses rather than an object itself. In the subject, this creates disquiet, upheaval, an overflow of imagination that becomes an abyss and in which it fears to lose itself. The speaker falling to his shattered knees before the immeasurability of nature and overwhelming inevitability of, for humankind. This evokes a turn to reason and restrain of the imagination, a turn that I suggest does not take place for Trakel's speaker and which hence forecloses Mittheil, as the sublime is not Mittheil bar, um, and hence it also forecloses allostasis. Trakel again writes um, in his letter to Hermione, I think it would have been too, it would have been terrible to live like this all the time, in the all animal instincts that drive life through the ages. In a letter to Erhard Buschberg in 1911, Trakel notes that instead of succumbing to the instincts, he's determined to, quote, subordinate myself unconditionally to what is to be presented, mich bedingungslos dem Darzustellenden unterzuordnen. Darstellung or presentation is a specific function of determining judgment under the power of reason. For determining judgment, the universal, the rule, principle, or law is given, and the judgment subsumes the particular under it, a reversal from the aesthetic judgment grounded in reflective judgment. However, for Trakos speaker, self-knowledge, insofar as it denotes relation to the world, has become foreclosed, as he has become what I would consider a purely transcendental subject of the unit of our perception. He has lost all that he had in common with the world or framework to relate himself to the world. In Springtime of the Soul, too, the speaker um, equates silence and death with pureness from the earthly hubris, a sunny abyss. Pureness, pureness, where are the terrible paths of death? O oh, grey stony silence, the cliffs of night, and the shadows without peace, radiant, sunny abyss. The speaker, search, uh, speaker searches for order, pureness, and the sunny abyss suggests that determinant judgment may be at work, rather than res the restraint of imagination by reason. Trakel writes to his sister, gone. Today, this vision of reality has sunk back into nothingness. Things are far from me, the voice is still more distant. Francis Sharp notes that this increased absence of a sensory, uh, perce a sensory perception in Trakel's speaker represents nature's withdrawal of her claims on the senses. Or rather, instead, I suggest the speechlessness and silence are a denial to let nature claim the senses, overwhelm them. I bend. <coughs> Mm. Oh yeah, still there. I bend my soulful ear again to the melodies that are in me, and my vivacious eye dreams again its images, which are more beautiful than all reality. I am with me and my world, my whole beautiful world, full of infinite sonority or wohlaut. While the Heidegger sonority arises from listening inwards and sharing this experience through echoing it outwards, not unlike Mittheil in Kantian terms, for Trakel, sonority is silence that ple pleasurably intones a wall clinked within the self alone. Okay. Don't have that either, sorry. The soul is a strangeness on earth, the speaker observes in the springtide of the soul where waters circle around the lovely games of fish. This strange implies a dis disentangling of soul from the experiences of the senses, of poetic subject from the lived world, and the rupture between the interior subject 
uh, subjective and exterior world as without midtail, a feeling of self and an anticipation of self in the world is foreclosed. In a letter to Irene Amtmann, Drakl writes, forwards to dir selber, move forward towards yourself. For Heidegger, the side of Drakl's poetry resides in abgeschiedenheit or apartness or the recluse, the wandering st stranger who is apart um, or recluse as the, as the title of the poem or the section of uh, Sebastian in Traum, the song of the recluse suggests. Um, for Heidegger, here a partners is the poem's sight um, because the music of the stranger's ringing radiant footfall inflames his followers' dark wandering into listening song. It is also um, where the plural at the end of the poem comes from rather than the singular as the title suggests, or uh, the, the singular in the title. Here Heidegger also draws on the meaning of Gesang in Gesang des Abgeschiedenen as Stimmendes Zusammensingen. Moreover, for Heidegger, there is no necessity for man to understand nature and his place within it, or his reaction to it in and through allostasis, since according, quote, according to his primary way of being, um, according to his primary way um, of being already outside in a present being of the already discovered world. Um, yeah, okay. Um, oder nach seiner primären Seinsart nach schon immer draußen einem begegnenden Sein in der schönen, entdeckten Welt zu sein. Heinz Wetzel, in agreement with Heidegger, considers silence and apartness as a sphere of the inner life of man, a solace to rest from the noise and strains of the world, the quotidian, to maintain his sonority. And I just put the poem uh, in English and in German here. Since I'm going to be talking about almost all of the stanzas. Um, already twilights the brow on the sensuous man, and there shines a little lamb, the good within his heart. And the peas of the meal for blessed are bread and wine by the hands of God, and there beholds you from night and eyes stillness, the brother that he may rest from thorny wanderings, or oh, the dwelling in the, in the salt blue night. Blue of night. Robert Framage argues um, for a departure from departedness. Translating demet as reflective, he suggests that the resulting line, already the brow of the reflective man in dusk, as, um, acts as a hinge in the poem to connect the worldly and the transcendental spheres. At once a movement backwards to departed ref departed's reflection on the world nature in his contemplativeness and his inner world. However, I suggest that my translation of twilighting equally reaches ac across time since it is in line with, first of all, the German word dämmert, but it is also ambiguous here whether it's dusk or dawn, again also reaching across time. Yet it does not reflect insofar as it's aimed at the reconciliation of the separated fears. Rather, the world is observed and tolerated by the, by the speaker as a temporary word for which the wanderer has to traverse. The line suggests a tiredness of the world and possibly of the life in it. He emerges from his solitary rest, ever more radiant as an acquiescing figure to traverse another path to reach the next shelter where be, he beholds stillness. There beholds you from the nighted eyes Stillness, the brother, that he may rest from thorny wanderings. Then ever more radiant, wakes from the black minutes of delusion senses, the acquiescence on petrified threshold. It then encloses him mightily, the cool blue and the glowing turn of autumn. But even as the wanderer rests in the place where his ancestors have once rested, and the solitary grandson will rest one day, there is no community of man to speak of. Rather, community is found in nature here. The trees are gathered, the birds fly in harmonies, the deer, the flowers. The world has opened itself up to man, but he has retreated. Again, silence emerges as measure of retreat embedded not in effect, but laws of reason, order, measure. The silent house and the legends of the forest measure and rule, and the moon paths of the departed. 
nature and man remain two separate spheres. And in the context of my project, I will go on to argue that this signals an autopoetic existence rather than an allostatic, an enclosed system of self-production rather than allostasis. But it is not only that, um, it is not because only that um, exists because it exists only in silence in a singular subject and is in a transcendence, transcendence, but um, also severs Kant's particular from the universal subject in the movement towards the idea of van, a delusion which Kant situates in the sublime and excess imagination. And here I have um, a quote from the general remark um, on the exposition of the aesthetic reflective judgment. Shall we? We'll read. Um, that's, yeah, the English. Where the senses no longer see anything before them, yet the unmistakable and inextinguishable idea of morality remains. There it would be more necessary to moderate the momentum of an unbounded imagination, so as not to let it reach the point of enthusiasm, rather than from fear of the powerlessness of these ideas to look for assistance for them in images and childish devices. This pure, elevating, men negative representation of morality, by contrast, carries with it no risk of visionary rupture, which is a delusion of van, of being able to see something beyond all bounds of sensibility, i.e. to dream in accordance with principles, to rave with reason, precisely because the presentation in this case is merely negative. If enthusiasm can be co compared with the delusion of sense or vansin, then I mean, visionary rapture is to be compared with delusion of mind or vanwitz, the latter of which is least of all compatible with the sublime, since it's brooding and absurd. However, van and vansin are not necessarily a madness here in line with the older conception of van as a sense of expectation, hope, and imagination. Erwartung, Hoffnung, Einbildung. A delusion of sense, or maybe merely a false hope. As Heidegger notes, the departed is a madman, but madness here does not mean a mind filled with senseless delusion. The madman's mind senses, senses in fact, as no one else does. Even so, he does not have a sense of the others. He is of another mind, potentially the mind of reason, not understanding, and as such, departed one is a man apart because he has taken his way in another direction, away from allostasis. 